Hey there, this is Dan, the producer of Mark and Carrie. If you like this show, we highly recommend you check out Watson's other podcast, Trending Globally. You'll hear more in-depth conversations about politics and policy from some of the world's leading experts, including, occasionally, Mark and Carrie. You can find it by subscribing to Trending Globally on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, on with the show. Thanks. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Still socially isolated, not sure what the week is or, or the month or the day. Um, trying to think of anything else that might be funny, but there really isn't anything that hasn't already been said a billion times. Uh, are you there, Mark? Oh, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm beginning. To, I'm beginning to feel that I'm not really there. So, so, so last week uh, I made this flippant comment about you know this is same old, same old for academics because we spend most of our time socially isolated and stuck in offices writing stuff. But this week I'm really beginning to feel it. I mean, whether it's the news that's coming out that like it's not going to be opening in June or July, this can persist through 2020. We might be even living with the virus longer than that. And it's just this feeling of kind of like, oh my God, this is it. This is no longer the exception. This is the rule. And that is becoming rather depressing to say the least. How are you handling it? I, I'm with you. I'm not sure if it's the utter uncertainty and the, you know, you think that you have control, but you actually have no control and this shows that we have no control. And so, you know, there's that psychological game or it's just the sameness of every single stinking day. Um, you know, I know I, I, I don't have, I'm all good here is I think it's just the psychological war warfare with myself really that I'm going through. So what's been freaking you out in terms of things you've been reading that make you fear for the future? Well, I, I'm with you, Mark. I mean, I sort of was under the naive impression that oh, I don't know, May or June, we'd all go back and I'd go to the movies and go out for coffee and get lunch and, you know, do all the silly things that I do. But I, Lord knows if this will happen in 2021, 2022. And that also changes how we think about how we get out of this in a kind of like macroeconomic sense. So the idea is that you just put everything in a deep freeze and then you come out of the freezer and then you start it all again. And on the one hand, that's true because unlike a war, right, there's no capital destruction. Nobody's bombing those restaurants. We're just shutting them down, right? But the problem is the longer you wait, these cash flow dependent businesses, they're very, very sensitive. And ultimately, a third of those restaurants might never open again, perhaps even more. But what's more alarming, and there was some data in China that showed this, that you take a GDP shock in these areas that weren't that hit by the virus, but the behavioral shock that follows it is much bigger. So what that means is, you know, people who haven't been affected that badly nonetheless are like, well, I'm not going to that restaurant. I'm not going to that mall. I'm not doing lunch anymore. I'm going to take a lunch with me to work, et cetera, et cetera. Plus the continuing social distancing restrictions. So if you, if you fundamentally change people's expectations and behavior, you're not going back to anything that you've got before. You really are in a whole new space. And it's just not clear to me that kind of the US in particular, given things like Florida's entire benefit system collapsing, is really built to deal with this stuff. Well, and those industries, like the, you mentioned malls, I mean, they're just going to totally collapse, right? I mean, they were on the verge of collapse as it is. And then they'll, I mean, they're pushed over the edge now, right? I mean, you just can't see an outdoor mall maybe, but the enclosed malls, you can't really imagine us headed back to those anytime, anytime soon. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's got to change retail completely, maybe more than Amazon does. But then the problem with this is we're also dependent upon the kind of the, inf the, the infrastructure of the internet economy at this point. The What's happening is Amazon share price is one of the few things that's going through the roof. You know, I imagine Zoom stock's doing very well just now. I haven't checked lately, right? But that bespeaks ever greater concentration in the economy, like basically everything in fewer and fewer hands. And we've got this program by the Fed, which is truly incredible, where basically they're, guarant they're t accepting junk bonds as assets and giving the corporates cash. So all the corporates have had their pockets filled, right, both by the CARES Act and then also Fed action. And then people who are what we're meant to be bailing out this time just can't even get into the offices to final, file an unemployment claim. And 1200 bucks when you're due a thousand, you know, 3000 on the mortgage, if you're lucky enough to get your check, isn't gonna do diddly squat. So, you know, we really are tearing things apart here. 
This is such a great point. I was listening to something. They said we're on the verge of a mortgage default crisis as well. And so you just, I mean, you start to add all these things together and you think, I mean, and here we are down the rabbit hole of everything falls apart. I mean, what do I mean? What do we have left? We're on a mortgage default crisis that, you know, states can even process unemployment claims. Uh, some states are open, some states are not. We don't have a good handle on testing. I mean, that's where it just, I know I went on a rant last time about this, but we really need a government, state, local, federal, anything that can be organized and respond to any one part of this. Yeah, it seems to be the case that by basically handing everything back to the states, Trump is essentially trying to protect himself rather than sort out the problems that need to be sorted. Because then you follow up with Mitch McConnell's comment the other day, the Marie Antoinette moment of let them eat cake, where you've, you've tasked these states with fighting this terrible problem, this healthcare problem. Their budgets are collapsing because they live and die by tax revenues. A lot of them have balanced budget amendments. So they're trying to fight a pandemic while their budgets are collapsing and they're having to lay off public sector workers, which is adding more to unemployment and more to the stresses in the system. It's like we designed a system that runs perfectly. I said this last time, it's the Mustang barreling down the road, right? That, that it's completely optimized. It assumes that you can always have credit. It assumes there's always liquidity. It assumes there's always jobs. It assumes there's always tax revenues. And then we just parked the car and none of that stuff happens anymore. And we're just watching what happens as it starts to fall apart. Right. We're at our tip top conditioning. We can run up, you know, a mile in 10 seconds and, you know, lift, you know, our weight plus some. And it just, when it's optimized, of course it's working. But I mean, whatever, Mitch McConnell, your state gets 40% from the federal government. So, I mean, I don't always agree with Andrew Cuomo and, you know, for what it's worth. I mean, his point about how much New York gives to the federal government versus a state like Kentucky. I mean, but I mean, this is like, why even have this debate about what state gives X and another state gets Y? I mean, this is when I think there has to be a stronger federal government that isn't, that isn't, uh, and that hasn't just left things to the states in the ways that the president has. But actually, Mark, this leads to a different point, and this is not a new, uh, a new point, um, is that, you know, so many were afraid that Trump is an authoritarian and that he's the strong man. He can't be an authoritarian and then also say, well, let the states decide. So in some ways, you see the president really giving up a lot of his authority to the states. Well, that's a fascinating point, because I was thinking about this this morning the what exactly again let's get trump out of the thing we can bring him back in for all the latest craziness about why don't you try gargling bleach or something like this if you want right but the more i think the more interesting one is put any president in this situation right now yes they might be more cooperative with the states yes they'd be doing different things there may be a national plan etc etc all that sort of stuff but at the end of the day there's an in principle at least there's an election coming up in november and it doesn't matter what you do it's going to look bad, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is not the economy anybody wants to run on. Whoever is the incumbent is basically going to suffer for this because it's not going well and it's not going to go well by November. So there's a way in which, you know, what exactly is the play? And I think Trump's play is essentially, I'm going to back off and hand it to the states, watch them fail because basically they're going to go bankrupt and then essentially stand to the side and say, well, you know, I let them do it, but then they blew it. So, you know, it's not my fault. I think that's exactly the playbook. And I mean, this starts to get into other stuff that I know we want to talk about. But in the meantime, he's going to give his base the red meat that they want, which is the liberate tweets, which is the immigration stuff, like all of the stuff that just gets them really excited because they have to turn out like crazy. Well, and like like crazy in like four states in order for him to just to hold the electoral college. I, I mean, you just they I mean, they have to show up for him and he knows that. Yeah, and so so something else on this point um, is Joe Biden wears Waldo. I, I I was thinking about that. I've been thinking about that all week. L literally, I see you more than I see Joe Biden. What is going on? And I think that we might have talked about this last time, but I think that's exactly the play. Is that you know Joe Biden is not a wordsmith. He's not a oratory you know superstar. In fact, he got charged with plagiarism in '88, which is why he dropped out of the presidential race. And so it is like just keep him in the shoe in the cabinet in the cupboard, and then bring him out when we really need him. But otherwise, he'll just like shoot himself in the foot. It's incredible. You would think this would be the one moment where you would basically say, okay, we're meant to be in this together. We're clearly not. 
let me come out and act as a unifying force as opposed to a dividing force. And, he, and again, I'm like, well, where's Waldo on this one? And he just doesn't seem to be doing anything very much. What else do you want to talk about? Just one last point on that. I think it's, you know, first do no harm. And that's exactly what the Biden campaign is thinking. Let's just not harm ourselves. <laughs> and so just continue to like have him there kind of, but not really do do anything. Yeah. I, you know, I've been thinking about um, the headlines on the paper just from around the world and, you know, you know, all the other countries doing a thousand times better than the U.S., etc. And I actually, as a uh, as someone who knows a great deal about this, as an expert on this, is the EU doing better than the United States? And is that a leadership issue? Is that just a, a general government structure issue? I mean, what what does that look like from your perspective? So it's really interesting. Basically, if you look at the Germans, right, much lower infection rate, much better testing, uh, high trust in science amongst the population, high trust in government amongst the population. Essentially, you can just draw a straight line between tr trust in government and effectiveness of lockdown. Right? That that's that's like really really highly correlated. Right? So there's this. Now, on what have they done that's different, right? Well, high trust in government, obeying lockdowns, uh, getting in there early, listening to the scientists. Yeah, okay, that's all true. You do have the interesting Swedish experiment, which is essentially, you know, very different and relies less on the government locking people away and on people taking their own responsibility for social distancing, etc. Again, in a society with high trust, you may get away with that. So they're doing well on that level. They've all got um, at least some form of comprehensive single-payer health care. They, they have private bits, but they're much smaller than they are in the US, etc. So all of that's good. They're doing way better. Done, right? Here's your problem. It's the EU because there's been this almighty food fight between southern countries led by Italy, who are the worst hit by the whole thing, and then the northern countries, particularly the Dutch and the Germans, over this issue of corona bonds. So let's get into what this is. Basically, Italy hasn't grown in 20 years. And what that means is, it, because it's, it's growing less than the interest rate it was paying on debt for a long time, its debt pile exploded. And now with corona, it's going to get even bigger. So the ECB basically has its back. They will buy Italian debt and extremists and keep the yields down. But at the end of the day, you still have this fundamental problem that Italy's basically bankrupt and can't, you know, can't grow. And that's a huge problem long term. So the Italians are like, okay, let's do a bond issue that's a mutualized bond issue. You take some of Germany's credit rating and France's credit rating and our credit rating and blah, blah, blah. And you put it all in. And then we float this to the market. Now, people will buy it because it's backed basically by the ECB. And also because everybody wants to hold safe assets. Nobody wants to hold equities. That's a safe asset. Yeah, right? And the Germans are like, nine. And the Dutch are like, are you mental? We're not going anywhere near your steaming pile of debt crap. So they've been at loggerheads over this. Now, they've just agreed a classic sort of smoke and mirrors deal where there's talk of 500 billion and maybe more than that, et cetera, et cetera. But you strip it all away. It's basically credit guarantees. And it's not actual replacing demand. It's not actually, here's a ton of money for your healthcare service. There's a wee bit of that, but not much. And it's at that level that I worry about Europe. On a country level, they're actually doing remarkably well because they're well governed in comparison. But at the end of the day, we have one advantage over them. We have the dollar. And that's the only bit of luck that we've got going for us. Whereas they have the euro. And if you're in the south of, of uh, Europe, that's a liability, not an asset. Do you ever see a point where the dollar isn't the, the currency of trade, that it moves to something else, or would that just be unthinkable? It's unthinkable because you've got to say what's your alternative. So 70% of reserves, more or less, 70% of everything that's traded is traded in dollars. So you need to change your currency into dollars to buy stuff like oil, right? I mean, you know, it's very sort of basic things like this. So what's your alternative? Well, the Chinese would need to internationalize their currency. But if they do that, you'll be able to move money in and out of the country. And what we found out in 2015 was when they basically allowed money to flow a little bit more freely, a trillion dollars left China. So basically, they would suffer capital flight in an order of like Argentina if you ever listed the control. So they can't be that guy. Then you've got the euro, and the euro you're stuck with because nobody can really get out of it. But at the same time, you know, you've got all these non-performing economies. Everybody's got the wrong interest rate. Nobody can agree on what to do. 
You know, it's not exactly sort of, hey, there's a global currency I want to hold. So in a sense, we're stuck with the dollar and that gives us huge advantage, no matter how badly governed we are. In a sense, I've often thought that the reason America is so crappily governed all the time, don't, don't just focus on Trump, is because we have this lack of an external constraint because everybody just holds dollars and we just import stuff for them and give them bits of paper. And so long as that continues, we don't need to actually think about anything very much. We could be as stupid as we want. Well, that's interesting because that tax on to, I've been thinking a lot about the American exceptionalism and, you know, we thought we were so great and strong and the best and for many, for many decades. And this has really shown all of the weaknesses and, you know, the very, very soft underbelly of the country. And so in some ways, the, I mean, just the dollar being the currency is, is another part of the story of American exceptionalism that even our currency allows us to think this. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It really is. Let's talk about, go, go micro again for a moment, the protesters, right? So the whole thing of the protesters facing off against the people in scrubs, etc. right? Now, it turns out a lot of this is astroturf. So basically, rich conservative groups have basically been organizing these protests in the same way they organized the Tea Party, right? Interestingly, the Koch brothers said that they want nothing to do with it. So uh, it's interesting that one of the main backers for that sort of stuff is backed away from it. Turns out that the Koch brothers actually believe in science. So there you go. But at the same time, I've got great sympathy for these people because what we've done with the CARES Act is show that America cares about corporates, right? You bet that all those airlines and all those cruise lines got their money already. You can bet that the Fed is like basically buying ETFs and saving BlackRock's ass and then basically... Uh, buying junk bonds to save the entire corporate bond market. Uh, so everybody's getting bailed, right? Everybody's a corporate is getting bailed. Now, we all know the statistic that 40% of Americans would have trouble getting $400 together in an emergency. Well, that emergency started four weeks ago. That $400 is gone. So for millions of people in this country, it's desperate, absolutely desperate. And they quite rationally say, we need to get back to normal. And then when you have people saying, you know what, it's not coming back, what do you do? You're making them feel powerless, anxious at the same time that they're desperate. And the the toxicity of it, when you're carrying your, your automatic weapon on your back, on the steps of the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan, you know that I grew up in, in Michigan. So I, especially those in Lansing, I really thought hard about because you think, this is about one second away from becoming something way, way more violent than I think anyone ever intended. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's it seems very lawless and it was very scary to me. And uh, I really thought those uh, healthcare workers that were standing there in the sidewalks, I think that was in Denver, I thought, wow, you're really putting your lives out there because if something, hap if something happens and it will happen like just, you know, a match, and that thing lights on fire in some way, like, you know, everyone's gonna, there's gonna be some really terrible outcomes of that. So I guess I thought about it in that way. And then, but I think you're right. My point about that you were making about desperation is that then adding on this next layer of, you know, having very easy access to loaded weapons <laughs> seems like a, you know, recipe for a total disaster. But, but even there in the Lansing protests, what I was struck by was, you know, there's a kind of a symbiosis between the media and and sort of these movements. And also, I mean, Trump, you know, I've made this point before. I mean, CNN wouldn't have a business model if it wasn't for Trump. All they do is just like bash Trump all day. That's what they do, right? And there's also a way in which, you know, when you take the picture of like the 200 people that have showed up of which perhaps 100 of them have automatic weapons on their back, right? That creates a particular image of this. But there was another image that was taken from inside the governor's mansion. And it was people who didn't have guns. They were just ordinary people. And, you know, they were poor, not poor, but, you know, these obviously weren't rich people. And they were classic sort of like normal Americans. And they were pressed up against the glass. There was no guns, but they were just both furious, furious and also afraid. You saw the fear in their eyes as well. Of like they don't know what, what's going to ha what's happening to them. Right, and they're looking to their political authority for some kind of relief and answers, and they're singularly unable to provide it. Yep, and and they're getting and just to, you know now take this back to the White House for a second. Is they're getting stirred up by a president who cares only for himself. He only he only cares about his ratings for his you know two hour talk show live you know reality TV show that we get from the from the White House every evening. He only he doesn't 
care of. I mean, like, look, I mean, he supported the Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, opening things up today and then was and then said, oh, I think that's a terrible idea. I mean, he just does not care about anybody but himself. And to stir up people's fears like this that are already on, you know, on desperation on the on the edge of everything. It's just I mean, you just, you don't really know what to do because you just want to, you know, lay down and cry and both hope that <laughs> the election is tomorrow so you can get voted out of office. Well, to go back to Europe for a minute, I mean, there's a really interesting uh, aspect of this in the way this has been sort of reflected through Europe, right? Usually when there's big disease problems in the world, like go back 20, 30 years ago when we hadn't destroyed our government infrastructure and put people from dubious universities in charge of programs they know nothing about just because they're political appointees, right? Um, when le there was Legionnaire's disease was first announced, the whole world looked to the CDC and said, what is this? How do we do it? And like they swung into action and figured it out. And that was it. Same with AIDS. Even though AIDS was an international effort, American leadership was absolutely crucial in this. And this time it's just absent. It's just gone. And no one's even looking for it. They're, they're basically, no one is actually saying, where is American leadership in this? Because they know it's gone. It really, and that's another way in which we've entered a whole new era. I'm not sure that even if Biden becomes president that you can put that one back together again. Because the whole world, in a sense, has just moved on. We've just gotten sick of it. I mean, first of all, it was, let's spend trillions of dollars in wars of choice that make no point whatsoever. And then let's have a giant financial crisis. Okay, we can look to you to bring things together again with that because you have the dollar and we all need the dollar, to go back to that point. But ever since Trump joined in, it's just been like, no, I don't want, you know, out of Paris. We don't need international stuff. I'm now going to stop giving money to the WTO, blah, blah, blah. And the whole world is basically like, okay, you're done. We're no longer looking at you. We don't care. You're over. And you see this in the press coverage, right? When you look at European papers, there's just less stuff about America. They just don't care anymore. I, I mean, I think that's so right. And the point about who owns the narrative here in the United States, who, oh, I mean, it's Andrew Cuomo, it's Gavin New it's the governors that are stepping in, right? I mean, it's not the president of the United States. I, in some ways, I think, you know, I mean, of course, this divides into red and blue, but even at the state level, people have just moved on too. I mean, governors are like, I got to get ventilators and PPE, like, and I've just got to source this stuff on my own. I guess we'll get, you know, Louis Vuitton to make us face masks. So I, I think you're right in that people have just moved. I mean, the political leadership has just moved on because they have to. Yeah, absolutely. Just, I have a um, uh, funny, I don't know, I actually think it's funny, but um a hard transition here is thinking about political leadership. Have you picked up on the stuff coming out of North Korea about Kim Jong Un and whether he's oh, alive? Yeah, right. No, fill me in, fill me in, because all I know is like he might have had heart surgery and then we don't know anything else. So what's the story? Yeah, so he might, yeah, exactly. He might have had heart surgery. And then I think two weeks ago, April 15th around then, was the his grandfather's birthday, Kim Jong Il. I think that's the grandfather. Um, uh, or that might be the dad. In any case, the grandfather's birthday, and he missed the big celebration for that. So people have been speculating where, you know, where was he for that? South Korea just issued something that said that they had not seen any evidence that the leader was was no longer with us. They had um, they believed that he was still alive. Um, the, the way I'm taking this is is that if he passes away, it's likely that his sister would take uh, the seat as the is it the chairman? I don't even know what his title is. Yeah, it's a family business, regardless. Yeah, supreme leader, and of course, therefore, yet another country to get a female leader before the United States. <laughs> that was my joke. That was my. That's that's not but that's a nice little ironic twist on it i would actually take it in a different direction which is the following if um kimiel twinkie passes away or has already done so that's the last friend trump's got i right, seriously <laughs> because his other buddy's bolsonaro and apparently bolsonaro's coughing his lungs up as we speak oh is he yeah but apparently he gave, he gave his speech and he was coughing all the way through it i don't believe in this virus <laughs> so good luck with that one mate just to stay in latin america for just a second mm -hmm. um so Panama, Peru, and Colombia experimented with gender-based separation. So um, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Ooh. women are, are allowed out of the house, and on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays as men. Um, and the results of this experiment are the following. Um, grocery lines, uh, grocery store lines are much longer on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, the streets were, quote, far emptier than on the other days. So when we think about the distribution of domestic duties, at least in these three countries, very much still on, on women. 
Well, I can assure you in our household, I just came back from Aldi before we recorded this. So there we go. How was that? Was there a big, did they have stuff or did they have toilet yeah. paper towels? They, they even had flour. What? Yes, they got flour. I'm just telling you now. But uh, go, go, go. But they don't have yeast. No one has yeast. Apparently, yeast is completely gone. I had actually, after our last podcast, I had to look up how to make my own yeast because there's no yeast anywhere. Yes. And uh, there's a few, I bet there's a few dodgy recipes online about how to do that. Yes, there are. <laughs> yeah, they like, you know, clip your toenails into a bowl and overnight the, the yeast will appear. Yes. Oh, lovely. That just sounds perfect. Come on, there must be some bright spots out there. What is there? What can we, well, what can we laugh about? What can we say, oh, we're doing fine? Just to continue with the royal family, because that has been an ongoing thread. Um, I don't know if you got the they moved uh, or change of address card that Harry yes. Meghan sent to you. Mm-hmm. You know, they've now relocated from, uh, I think they were in Vancouver, and now they've transitioned to Los Angeles. Um, they were delivering meals to people. Um, and, you know, my question is sort of actually along the lines of the protesters and media is it is they issued this warning to the British paparazzi that they would not deal. They would no longer deal with them in any way. And I thought, if the paparazzi don't follow you, do you exist? Or- <laughs> well, they did say in the British tabloids, right, to the to the people who have been awful to her oh, and the yes. press that like, you know, no contact whatsoever. But paparazzi are their own species. I mean, basically, if they think the picture will sell, they will follow you to the ends of the earth. So I think those two are always sellable. I mean, as I said before, you know, Ellie's the inevitable bill base because she's going to get back to doing acting, right? He's basically a sort of like photo-friendly, telegenic sort of like nice bloke, or at least that's his public persona. And eventually he's going to get a ghostwriter to write that book called Growing Up Royal. And, you know, that's going to be it. And then, and then you know, all the dirt on the royal family as soon as the Queen's gone. Although she's just had her 94th birthday and, you know, in the middle of an epidemic which seems to be affecting old people and none of the royals are affected. Which just goes to show you that David Icke's prediction that the royal family are all space aliens, lizards who have been <laughs> controlling us, it must be true because none of them have got COVID. So there you go. That's that's that one. The Queen gave that kind of beautiful speech to the country. And I kind of, I was, you know, for a second I thought, I kind of wish I was British because it was just, you know, this 94-year-old woman saying, we will meet again. We will see each other again. And it was, I mean, you just kind of get, I got chills just because we don't have anything like this in our country. If anybody yeah, anybody will. If you go on my Twitter feed, I don't know if you saw this one, but I juxtaposed a Trump press conference to a Merkel press conference. <laughs> and it's just brilliant. So Merkel is like, you know, she's she's a PhD physicist. And she 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 gets it, right? And she's like, no, here's the problem with the herd immunity. We don't exactly know what this is and is the testing issue, blah, blah, blah. And she just gives this incredibly fluent thing about what's going on, what are the problems, why these are problems, what they're doing about it, the whole thing, totally calm, whatever. And then you just click on Trump and like, you know, pick any day because every day it's almost as if he wakes up and says, I wonder how batshit I can get today, right? So, you know, you wake up and you think, well, I'll just ban green cards, right? It's got nothing to do with the disease, but somehow I'm going to link the two of them together. And then, of course, you know, the bleak stuff and all the rest of it. You're just like, where do you go next? I mean, literally, where could you possibly go next? And then Merkel's, you know, again, you just click back to Merkel and you're just like, yeah, everybody else is having a better time. I mean, it's just imagine Merkel say, well, light therapy or maybe you know, shrinking yourself down to the size of an atom and then eating yourself might solve the problem. <laughs> and you're like, I you just can't imagine those words coming out in German or English ever. No, ever. Right? Under any circumstances. No, absolutely not. I mean, you can imagine her saying, no, we're not going to give the Italians any money, but we're going to pretend we're doing so, right? That's actually what's going on. But nonetheless, you know, the sort of the, I actually understand what's going on and I'm trying to communicate confidence to the people who are looking to me. It's, it's it's an interesting approach. We might try that around here, but we're more interested in trying to basically tear each other's face off, I think. Have you had any funny Zoom call stuff? Like SNL did a big spoof of, you know, people going to the bathroom with the camera on and, of course, someone too close to the camera as so you're looking at their nostril. Have you had anything uh, like that? Right. No, I'm, I, I, there was a piece up on the BBC, actually. I think it was on the BBC about why Zoom calls are so tiring. And basically, it's it's because, you know, when, when you're actually talking to someone, right, you're not looking at them the whole time. And the expectation is that everybody has their camera on and they're sitting there looking at the screen. And it's just nonsense. Nobody ever does that. Even when we're in lectures, you don't look at the speaker the whole time, right? You know, you're writing something down or you're wondering what you'll have for lunch. When you talk to someone face to face, you don't actually look at them the whole time. 
And yet, you know, this is what we're expected to do. There's been some um, studies that have shown that productivity has gone up because of this, but it's in part because people are terrified of their bosses not thinking that they're working enough. And with unemployment at 30%, they don't want to get fired. So essentially, you know, we're, 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 we're stressing ourselves out just in the micro level of day to day on top of the sort of the macro existential angst about the future that we've been talking about. So, yeah, so basically, I, you know, I'm still at the same page whereby my answer to everything is gin is the tonic. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's probably a good solution. We should drink it in hopes of curing COVID, too. So last time we ended on making bread out of uh, pizza dough. Do you have anything for us this week? On some on some hack, something you've made a gin and tonic with a twist that's even more delicious. Anything? Um, I did make a quiche, so that doesn't sound that impressive, but it was a quiche from a sort of Swiss recipe that was given uh, to me personally. And the original is basically double cream with an egg in it, right? So I mean, it's like a heart attack, you know. Yeah. But I, I kind of hacked it a little bit because I didn't have that much cream. And what I ended up doing was I put the eggs in the bowl. I did two eggs rather than one. And then I took a bunch of cream cheese, right, which is something I never use and sit to the back of the fridge for like forever, right? And then essentially used an electric mixer to like blend the cream cheese into the egg. So it was all one sort of mix, right? And then after that, I put in uh, truffle gouda. Uh, so then you do then you do the onions and the bacon, right, into the shell, which you make yourself, which is actually remarkably easy. And uh, you put the onions and bacon and then put this mix of cream cheese and truffle gouda uh, and, and cream, right, and then baked it in the oven. And I literally could have dived into it and eaten the whole thing from the inside out. It was amazing. So I'm now a quiche fan. Yeah. Um, well, well on that note, I'm going to go to the kitchen. Exactly. It's lunchtime. Let's go eat lunch. Yes, exactly. We'll be back. We're hoping to do these like a little bit more frequently just to um, to stay sane. To connect with each other. Yes, to stay sane. And, you know, obviously there's there's always a lot to talk, uh, talk about. Thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. Take good care. Bye. Stay safe.